Hi everyone, I'm really excited to have Mike Bauman with me. I'm in the UK, Mike's in LA, and of course we're recording this via Zoom, which is the way that everybody talks these days. So um, Mike is a sought after and uh, you know, widely known uh, gaffer in, in Hollywood, and I imagine he's probably worked all over the place as well, but we're, we're going to spend a bit of time talking about some recent films, uh, you know, the art and science of lighting, and hopefully learn a few of the things which are less obvious, because when you work on this kind of scale, on this kind of film, you, you know, you, you have to get it right first time. Uh, Mike, thanks ever so much for joining us. It's, it's, it's really nice to get this opportunity to, uh, to talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And um, I actually would like to start by talking about some um, actual films that we've, we've seen recently. Uh, a couple of films that uh, I've seen recently were, were Vice, which is the one about Vice President Dick Cheney. Uh, and the second one, which I saw the other day, was Ford versus Ferrari, which is um, like a a really ambitious film in almost every way. Uh, it's, it's a great story. I won't go into it, but uh, you, get, you get a wide variety of lighting situations. It's almost hard to imagine a, a, a film where, where, where you, you'd, you know, have, have more difficult scenes to light. What was your, I mean, what was your initial reaction when you, when you realized you were going you're to be working on this? I mean, it was uh, it was pretty interesting on Ford's Fry because uh, I had just finished um, uh, the movie before that I had done was Vice, and we finished that in December, and then we started doing camera tests. In, I think in June for uh, Ford, and so it was funny to be doing two movies back to back with Christian Bale, and especially because yeah. he had gained so much weight for Vice, and then he walks into the camera test our first camera test, like rail thin. And I'm like, was that healthy <laughs> You know, to do that? He, he had lost a ton of weight, but I was, I'm not much of a car person. So I didn't really, I was looking forward to working with Faden as we had done commercials and stuff together. And um, he's, he's a lot of fun to work with. And I knew the, the key grip Ray Garcia really well. And so uh, it was going to be, a, you could tell it was going to be a fun job. I didn't really know much about the story or the cars or anything like that. And, you know, and so uh, when I read the script, I was like, wow, this is a really interesting story because it wasn't really about the, I mean, the racing, it was a huge canvas, but it was more about the, the you know, the, between, the relationship between the two main characters and just kind of what they were doing in their teams and all that. And so it was pretty cool. And then after talking to Faden and what kind of what he was looking at wanting to do, uh, you know, and just kind of the scale and scope, I was like, wow, this is going to be a fun, very unique project. And it was good to see that a studio would invest uh, the kind of money to get the, give it the canvas that it needed to tell that story. Cause that was not a, you know, I mean, that was, so, you know, Hey, oh, we want to do a car movie that's set in the, uh, you know, in the sixties. I mean, what, you know, so the fact that they were able to get the money and, and to do it and, you know, big construction and everything was fantastic. I know. And you, and you know, you talk about the canvas and the thing that struck me was this, the sort of epic scale of, uh, of the images, you know, these, these shots uh, at you know at the at the, at the airport uh, at dusk, uh, you know, and a w wonderful uh, wide skyline, but but also that must have been pretty tricky to light because you know, dusk typically isn't the best light for shooting people, is it? Yeah, I mean, what was interesting about that was um, it was a scramble to get that that shot and. Um, you know, because the it was uh, out on the runway uh, and the sun's going down, and so we took two three uh, sixties and we just sat there. And I was just in the in the uh, with Lonnie the the, um, the DIT and Faden, which is kind of sitting there on the monitors and just lowering, raising the color color temperature and lowering the intensity and lowering the intensity and just changing it per take because it was it was dropping so so fast and just you know getting the right level of underexposure on it. It was really a uh, it was, Changes you know, I think that whole scene, yeah, because I think we had the whole scene shot in like 20 minutes. It was in and out. 
Yeah. So uh, it was a lot to scramble and get, and then there was close-ups and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. And then I mean, we can probably show show uh, one of these pictures. Um, uh, the 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 scene around the uh, the the pit stop on on the actual track, and you've got a yeah. You know, we we've got a like a wide shot, and you can see some lights you've put up on, uh, you know, on cranes there, and mm -hmm. you've got a lot of practicals in there as well. The actual lighting yeah. along the pit stop, and you've got like advertising and all the par paraphernalia you would get around a genuine racetrack, but actually at dusk, uh, and yeah. again, that must have been so challenging. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot about working with the set decorators and, and that team and the production designer about putting all that stuff in there. There was over 300 practicals on that set. And whether it's fluorescent tubes or incandescent or neon or signage and things like that. And so what was great about that is we always had something to look into as we were looking down the pit, the pit row. Um, and then we were you know, lighting wise, it was just kind of, I mean, there's a bunch of blue screen because they have had to extend and, and yeah. do all that. But then, um, <clears throat> you know, we had these, uh, uh, the condors, the cherry pickers that had uh, a couple of 360s and a couple of, of uh, moving lights in there from high end systems that were highlights. Uh, you know, so we have, we had a uh, focusable sharp light uh, for backlights and, and picking up things we could use. And then we also had a soft wash with the 360s. And, um, it was really, you know, because that scene had, we, at the pit row, we had day work, obviously, we had dusk, we had dawn, we had night, we had rain, rain yeah. at night. I mean, there was a lot of different variables there. And, uh, but really during the course, the during the prep period, the ability to be able to talk with set decoration and with the production designer, just kind of about how much practical is going to go in there. And, you know, a set like that, you can never have enough practicals. You can always turn things off or shape things in different ways, because you had to show the period of time through the course of the night, too. Like maybe not everything's on or certain things turn on at different times and stuff like that. So a lot of, a lot of things to, sh to shoot in there as a background, which is great. So, yeah. And other parts of the, um, the film really, really knocked me out. Um, well, one of them was the, uh, I, I guess it was all taking place inside an aircraft hangar, but there were some offices that uh, Carol Shelby was using and there was a scene where he was, I won't give anything away for people who haven't seen it, but there was a scene where he was upstairs in this uh, white painted office uh, with a Ford executive. And it just looked amazing because it, it totally looked like it was uh, lit by daylight, but it was, it was very, it was very intense, uh, yeah. almost stark. But but he didn't look unnatural. It just looked like a, a very brightly daylit office, and and it, it was a big office too. So uh, sort of long linear type of office, and uh, it it all looked consistent. So it didn't it didn't look artificially lit in any sense at all. But of course, I guess it it was. What was your approach to to that scene? I mean, Faden is very much into naturalism, and so. Yeah. Uh, the the set itself has a you know, obviously giant hangar doors that are wide open, and so the kind of the natural ambience is in there. The, the set itself was pretty far back into the hangar, yeah. So we just extended it through um, taking um, uh, HMI through the windows that surround it, just kind of pushing a lot of ambience in there. But then for the office itself, we had uh, like four Airy three sixties, there the large sky panel that we had uh, diffused ran through large diffusions and just did a probably yeah. about 40 feet of this. So it was a, just, a, just a natural soft push that was slightly underexposed. So it just kind of felt like it was coming in from the outdoors. And the other scene that really impressed me was Henry Ford II's office, yeah. which of course is enormous. And again, it had all this mid-century modern furniture in it. Yeah. But, but again, a very sort of clean, modern, in an old fashioned way, looked to it and the, there was like I, I i guess teak and mahogany woods and all all mm -hmm. the natural colors came out really really nicely yeah that that set was great it was at the la times building in downtown la oh, okay. and it was a it was like an old executive office they had up there boardroom and uh what's great about that set is that there's just a lot of contrast within the frame you have the highlights of the windows and then you exactly. have like the dark wood so the 
there's a lot of great contrast opportunities and where, you know, with the skin tones and everything. And, and so, uh, again, that was just like extending this kind of naturalism inside of it and using like large soft sources, four by eights and things like that, some bounce and some direct and just keeping it soft, but, but trying to maintain contrast within that. So on the, for the race itself, how much of that mm-hmm. was CGI? I mean, they had, I imagine quite a lot because they had these, these scenes where like, you know, the two cars were like neck and neck and, and the drivers were looking at each other. Yeah. Yeah, that was, um, so they had built the pit row, they built at an airport that's out of about uh, 40 minutes outside of LA. And they used the runway as the pit row. And so yeah. they built that there because we had that space for about four months. And um, uh, the, most of the driving uh, that was not in pit row was happening in, they shot that in Savannah. In Georgia because the roads are very similar there to Le Mans back in the time uh, so what we did then for the um, for the stuff where the drivers are tight and all the close-ups and things uh, <clears throat> we took over a hangar and uh, the special effects department had rigged uh, a system for the cars so that they were actually floating on air and could move next to each other very tightly so you could do those really small okay. granular moves back and forth yeah. and then um, we shot into green screen, but had video panels around the cars that we were running plates through so you could see all the activity and the highlights and things like that. And then we had some moving lights to do some direct light and things of that nature. But it all flowed very well from that standpoint. And uh, really, um, really, uh, they did a great, you know, uh, Olivier, uh, who did the visual effects, did a fantastic job on that and tying that all together. Yeah. So staying with the, the, the Christian Bale theme, you mentioned that you worked on Vice, which I yeah I absolutely loved. I thought the story in it was great. I didn't see it in the best circumstances. It was on a like a nine inch screen on the back of an aircraft yeah. seat. But <laughs> that's uh, how we do our movie viewing. Yeah. The the way I I love the way you felt in the period. And I guess it did span a quite a couple of decades at least yeah mm-hmm. um or more and uh but the other thing i was going to mention is that um christian bale had like a ton of makeup and presumably yeah. prosthetics and that must be you know you however skilled you are at lighting skin normal faces that's not a normal face is it yeah, I mean, you know, Greg Fraser shot that, and uh, <clears throat> we had done a lot of testing with the makeup team to really kind of determine what, well, just the prosthetics, the reflectivity of the makeup, the color, all that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> and especially, like you said, it covered several decades. So you had a period where, you know, uh, much younger Cheney, and as he gets older, and then, and then uh, into later years of his life. And there was always, um, I mean, the makeup team did a great job. They won the Academy Award for it. And, uh, but <clears throat> the head of the makeup department and Greg were constantly talking, especially when they get on set, you get a, you get Christian under the light, you take a look at it, you take a look at how the prosthetics are moving as he's moving his head, depending on what the action oh, is, yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, things like that. And then addressing on set specific challenges that might come up and, um, yeah, I mean, they had a really good level of communication going, and and certainly the testing because we shot that particular that that job we shot on film, and because Adam McKay, the director, is a big film, uh, really wants likes to use film, and so uh, it was important to do tests to really see what the end result would be, you know, since you couldn't see it right there on the monitor, but there was a definitely a lot of good dialogue happening between Greg and and makeup and just making subtle changes as you'd see things depending on the day. Yeah, you know. yeah, and I guess you had to, you know, from the lighting angle, you had to be adaptive uh, as as well because this, the you know the the makeup prosthetic thing was 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 just just different, wouldn't respond, you know, like a normal face. Yeah, yeah, it definitely. Um, he definitely had, uh, you know, the different periods had different different reflect to it and things like that yes, yes. and the other the other thing you're really conscious of is the ambient temperature in the uh, in the space because okay yeah 
And that was one of the things that we were shooting with LED really helped because we used a lot of digital Sputnik and a lot of um, uh, overhead ambient LED to keep the temperature down of the, uh, of the okay. place. You know, because uh, with Steve Carell was also in a lot of heavy makeup there to make it look like Donald Rumsfeld. And um, it was, you know, Steve was very upfront. He was like, look, with all this makeup, I'm going to start sweating if it's hot in here. And it was with, we were shooting in stage in December, which in LA is, is very cold. And so um, it was on stage, everyone was bundled up in parkas and heavy jackets and stuff because, you know, there was just no heat being generated because we were trying to do as much of it with LED as possible. You know, we didn't really, I don't even think on stage in the White House, we even used one bit of incandescent outside of this, the practical fixtures, you know. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, you know, as a viewer, that's not something you ever think about, but but uh, you, you you just imagine what a disaster it would be if people were sweating heavily under oh, yeah. their makeup, under their prosthetics. Yeah, and, and, you know, Christian already was doing an insane amount of time in the chair just before he would come to work. It was mm. like, you know, he would have like 2 a.m. leaves from his home and things like this to be able to be ready by 8 in the morning. And so it was it was some pretty extreme stuff. And so it was really important that when we had him on set, we were able to be as productive as possible. And so, you know, I think Greg's choice to light that with as much LED as possible was really a, a, a great direction to go. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll come back to some more specific, you know, craft in, in a little while. But I just wanted to ask you a few things about, you know, your approach to lighting in general. And I'm just wondering, at what start, what point do you start mentally designing the set? Is it is it when you see a script? Is it when you talk to the the director? Um, it's. I mean, it's all. It all. It all depends on the job. Like, um, you know, some jobs, uh, uh, some projects are like, you know, a cinematographer. Hey, I'm going to be doing this thing in six months, but think about this and this and this, you know, and uh, just to think about some solutions for this. And so that's what, you know, some of the, or I might get uh, some concept art sent over or something like that. And then, you know, hey, did you see that stuff? Let's talk about that. Sometimes it's just the script shows up and you can take a read of that and make some decisions and, and yeah. kind of get an idea of that. But I think a lot of it is those first initial conversations with the cinematographer about kind of what they're, what's in their head. What, what do they, how do they see this thing? And, you know, and depending if uh, there's some cinematographers that work with uh, several times, which is great. So, yeah, kind of a shorthand. And other ones where you're starting down the road for the first time. So it's a lot of conversations about, well, how black is black, how white is white. Yeah. You know, what do you consider a saturated color? All that kind of stuff. So you kind of get an idea of kind of what the parameters are that 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 uh, they kind of see. Yeah. And, and presumably as you get closer to the production, you then start... Uh, building a relationship with, um, I don't know, post-production and yeah. set designers, production Absolutely. designers. Yeah, I mean, that those conversations, I generally like to start as early as possible, especially with the production designer, the art director, um, set decorator, because those are really where, uh, you know, when you're talking about lighting, so much of lighting is really communicating with other departments. If the end result is to get a really good visual image, you know, I mean, it could be about, hey, what's the reflectivity of the paint on the set? Um, yeah. Hey, could we put, is that window that's there, is it possible to move it over here? And here's why, because of the way that things are going to be staged. And I often try and come in early if possible, as just even for a few days on a project, even before my prep starts because you have the luxury of some time then and you can have a conversation and, and make sure as people are building stuff, it's headed in a direction that everybody's on the same page with. Cause yeah, you can, I guess you, worse. Can, you yeah. can stop problems being built in. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You, 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 you get ahead of the problems before they really become problems. And, uh, and so that's a really critical component of it. Um, but you know, the production designer is absolutely can be a tremendous, uh, uh, ally in creating good visuals. I mean, that is, you know, and, and certainly yeah. great cinematographer production designer relationships are, are, you know, they really yield fantastic results. Absolutely. Because I guess ultimately all you have on the set is light and it's the interaction of the lighting design and the production design is going to be what's going to be hitting that camera's sensor. 
Yeah, and and it's great because you also have some other folks. You know, at the end of the day, you're standing. You know, you're there, the cinematographer, and you are there, and you're looking at the set. And this is what you have. And what are the tools you have? Not just light, but also like you know the onset painter. Like we usually have a uh, a person who can quickly you know, hey, could you re- get some more reflectivity on that wall, or can we paint down this? Yeah. You know, paint down this this uh, uh, sill so it's a darker, you know, and things like that. And that's another area that is that is really critical. And then also having just a phenomenal, the, you know, a really good key grip is, is uh, in the states is super critical because that's a a, a huge. Um, you know, companion in the whole journey. And for people who are not experienced, haven't had the experience of being on a set like this, how much time do you get to, you know, once let's say the majority of the set is built, how much time do you get to design and set up the lights before the actual shooting starts? I mean, it it depends on kind of what the set is. There's a lot of, but generally it's like, um, uh, you know, I'll certainly have laid out ideally um, during the initial phases of construction, kind of what our lighting plan would be. And so that we can analyze if there's anything that needs to be built or adjusted during the construction process. And then, um, uh, you know, a few weeks before uh, we actually do the photography, uh, there's usually a rigging crew in there that's laying in all the infrastructure, the power, the data, all that kind of stuff, hanging trusses and things like that, that for where lights will hang. And then ideally, if we're, if we're fortunate enough on, if we scheduled it accordingly, we'd have a day of, uh, you know, pre-lighting in there beforehand to really kind of look at it. Sometimes you're able to bring a camera in there and do some, and just really yeah. see with the LUT and everything that's built in. So then you can kind of see how it works all the way out and, and where, it's, where it's headed and if there's any changes that have to be made before production. And so I yeah, usually have a couple of weeks. I, I just left field uh, question, but I, I remember talking to you before and you mentioned that, uh, you know, once at least y- you're, you started thinking about lighting a set when you heard a piece of music. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was with, um, uh, on Phantom Thread. Like when we started doing tests, I mean, Paul, the director, he, uh, one of the first things he had was, was, um, you know, before we even started the conversation, he was playing, uh, he and Johnny Greenwood had already, Johnny had already composed the main theme for the, for the project, for the, for the film. And so Paul had that and it was just Johnny playing it on a piano that he probably recorded on an iPhone. And uh, Paul had that and he was kind of playing that as we were talking in our first day of tests and just talking about like kind of, you know, it just kind of set the mood for everything. And then he also had a playlist of all sorts of different, um, uh, you know, music from the period that he was going for. And so you kind of dip into that playlist and have that. And so then when you're, after you're done testing and you're looking at the stuff, uh, you're looking at the footage in the lab, because we always shoot on film with him, uh, you know, he's playing this music and you're really getting a good sense of kind of where the, the mood and the tone for the, for the uh, pieces just from the music of it. And it's a luxury to have that component on the front end, because usually you don't have any idea what's going on with the music until the, you know, the project is, we're long off the movie at that point. Yeah. So it's really interesting how he starts to integrate some of those other areas early, really early in the process. Yeah. Shows you how important, you know, music is, doesn't it? Oh yeah, Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. um, I, I think um, it's interesting to me to look at how, things have changed over the last two decades, let's say. And, um, you know, obviously LED, the move to LED lighting is, you know, a massive change. And, the, you know, LED lighting is still not able to do everything, but it's able to do a lot now. And I guess, what what circumstances do you think, you know, LEDs have advantages over more traditional kind of lights i mean it certainly as the spectrum of an led emitter has gotten so much better mm. a lot of the uh, disadvantages have gone away yeah i think um the big advantages are with led um uh, there's certainly an economical advantage because the support structure you need to operate it is a lot less you don't need to deal with external dimmers 
you don't need to deal with additional gel and things like that. I mean, especially, you know, with a lot of the sources now, the expectation is, is that they're all multicolor and they all do all this amazing stuff. Yes. Um, and they generate, you know, very beautiful soft light quite quickly. It's interesting though, because I think that like, uh, sometimes they're too good looking. It's too, per you know, it, it has a certain, it is because it has a certain beautiful quality to it that, uh, that is gorgeous and it's something that most people strive for but then on certain projects that doesn't that's not the right thing you want some more texture to the light you want some more uh, um, you know some more irregularity loosening the bolts so to speak you know of the light so it has a little bit more character to it and because I mean you line up like four 360s and run them through uh, heavy diffusion I mean it's phenomenal looking light you know it's great but it doesn't necessarily always be the best thing for the story, depending on what's happening. And that was the thing on uh, when we were doing Phantom Thread. It was a big discussion about LED because, you know, it was almost too glamorous for uh, in a certain way at, w with that. So there's a lot of things to add texture. We used a lot of atmosphere in that yeah, particular yeah, structure, you can things like that. Grunge it up a bit. Yes. I mean, it's a little bit like the not not totally like, but a little bit like the argument about digital recording for audio versus analog, you know, vinyl versus yeah. digital. I mean, I'd always argue that you can grunge up your digital recording to make it sound more like vinyl. And there are people who say that you always lose something with digital, but I mean, and of course there is the, the analogy with uh, film versus um, yeah, absolutely. Di digital recording. I mean, do you, do you have a different approach to, you know, working with a, a digital camera as opposed to a film? I mean, you know, look now with, uh, it is, I mean, digital has this amazing advantages. The LF mm. is, you know, especially now that it's gotten to large format and the LF mini, I, those are huge advances as far as like, you know, ASA and things like that. And, um, you know, <clears throat> I think the thing is, is film has a certain texture to it and, it is really unique and you can absolutely do post a lot of post things adding live grain and all that kind of stuff but as a um uh you know film itself is very uh it's just the emotion and everything has it's just unique characteristics and levels yeah. of imperfection which are really appreciated you know as far as kind of making that experience something um you know, I mean, with digital, it's like you certainly have, uh, uh, you know, you can certainly work at like insane light levels. It's like, you know, it's yeah. not a big deal to be working at like a, a third of a, you know, a third of a foot candle or something like that, you know, on a night exterior. I mean, it's just, it's insane. You know, you know, a lot of times you can see your eye can't tell what's on the set, you know. Do, so, do, you, yeah. find, do you find there's less pressure on set when you're using digital it just in the knowledge that when you shoot film if something goes wrong it's just so expensive or is that not a factor at, at the level that you're work working on i mean i don't think it's really as big of a factor because it's like i mean everyone's uh, you know there's really like uh, even though film is a mechanical process it's like you know i mean digital itself also has lots of errors in it too i mean you know not lots but i'm saying i've had mm -hmm. like a magazine go bad on a digital system and things like that. Oh yeah. You know, you know, and it's like, you know, and uh, you, so you're like, you, it definitely has its own failings from a, from that perspective, workflow perspective. But yeah, I mean, I think the uh, film itself is, is, I mean, you know, obviously if you have got good maintained stuff, it works, it's, it seems to hold up pretty well, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, I really enjoy it when, because those, those, those moments that you shoot film are so fleeting nowadays. Like it's a big commitment yeah. for a production to do it and a lot less do it. And certainly lab services and everything are becoming harder and harder to deal with yes. and have available. And so it's like, as much as I can be involved with the film production, it's, it's a good thing. It's, it's very enjoyable. So just going back to the lights themselves, modern lights, uh, and especially with LED lights where they come in so many shapes and sizes, do you find this gives you more a wider palette of tools to choose from? Do you find that, that you know, it's kind of more granular um, and, and, you know, gives, gives you maybe new options and new ways of lighting a scene? Yeah, I mean, there's some really great tools out there. And I mean, there's tons of fantastic options for just general soft light. And not only like just the quality of the light, but just in the, 
form it comes in where it's a sky panel versus like a uh, a kino flow freestyle versus like a, a like your light tile versus like uh you know a cream source spacex i mean these are all different things that are they're different they they're you can get really granular in your application for that mm. and then the interesting part now is is like in quality and i mean and i say the word quality i don't mean like how good it is it's more just like the signature of the light like you know what's one thing that's great about tungsten the parkhand the parkhand is like a, such a basic simple thing but you know a par bulb a par 64 and closed bulb is just you can skip it you can bounce it you can you can use the edge of the beam to light with you can do a lot of very interesting shaping and that that's so there are starting to be things that are coming into that space from an led perspective you know the optics of leds are definitely different from that but it's like finding lights and like um you know one thing i use um certainly for uh a, it's nice to have things that are punchy and things that are soft yeah things that you can bounce or scrape into the ground or, or bang into some sort of reflective surface and find happy accidents there that are really unique. And, uh, uh, you know, there's certainly some tools that, that work very well with that. I mean, I use a, you know, the, like the cream source micro color works really good for that type of a thing. Very small, very potent, be able to do a nice skip bounce. We, we had a, uh, on the last show, we had a series of materials that you could just use to bounce into reflective surfaces, textures, what, ah, what's this? Okay. Try that around, you know, and that kind of thing. And sometimes it'd be a park hand, sometimes it'd be a micro color. Sometimes it'd be a, a DS one, you know, you could do different things depending on what was happening. And that was kind of, it's, it's, it's all about trying to like expand that tool set, but certainly, uh, you know, we, the softness, the soft source department in led well covered. Absolutely. Tons of options there. It's the, it's the other types of lights that are the other kind of qualities of light that we have in the tungsten space, you know, but it's hard once the bell is rung for multicolor, it's very hard to go back because the versatility yeah. of it is just phenomenal, you know, and, and the fact that you can make a lot of quick choices and help the creative flow of, you know, that's really great, but warm that up some more. Okay, cool. Beep. There you go. How's that? Uh, take a deck right, right there. Stop there. And you can make, you can, you know, it's ways of lighting that you couldn't do 10 years ago because it would involve, oh, let's put the gel on. Okay, bring in the ladder. Let's do this. Uh, you know, let's change it. You know, the creative palette is open a lot more, which is great. And there's just one thing uh, before we finish I wanted to ask you about. I, I understand you made a, uh, there was a production of Macbeth that you worked yeah. on and it was shot in black and white. I mean, yeah. that must that must be so weird. I mean, how, how, it's how great. Approach a black it's great. And white shoot? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, that was the movie we were working on before everything stopped. Um, and oh, right. Bruno, yeah. So, uh, uh, Bruno Delbanel, who's a cinematographer on it. Um, it's really interesting because Bruno does fantastic work and, but it's all a very, um, he likes a lot of soft light. Generally speaking, that's his, that's a, a lot of what he does. And, um, when we, were t when we were looking at Macbeth and doing tests, it was like, we need to use, you know, we want to obviously use some hard light because it was all about contrast and shape and form and things like that. And we actually, it, what's interesting about how we're lighting that thing is we're using a lot of, of automated fixtures that, um, you know, a lot of moving rock and roll type lights because they have framing shutters. So you can like a source four where you can really cut things in. They have uh, zoom and other, uh, uh, diffusion controls and things. So it, it really fits very well with black and white because black and white's all about contrast and creating contrast and, and how do you create separation when you don't have what your eye is normally used to with color separation and things like that, you know, that's the, you strip that out and it's really a unique set of challenges because of that. Cause you, you can get away with some, you can fool your eye in black and white in ways that is just amazing you know, like to create depth or to create contrast and things like yeah. that. It's really, really special. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm hopefully, hopefully we come back and finish that movie. That would be great. Yeah. I, I can't wait to see it. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, Mike, uh, it's been fantastic. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks. Thanks ever yeah, so much. Absolutely. And uh, absolutely. Thank you. There's a ton of information in what you said. Um, it's just absolutely brilliant. Uh, thanks again. Uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Take care.